Hey, it's Talknosis, your show about Gnosticism, mysticism, related topics. We got a great show, a broad show. We have a guest who's going to try to do the impossible and explain mysticism to us within 45 minutes to an hour. We've got scholar and artist Emily Russo. Hello, Emily. Hello, how are you? I'm, uh, I'm awesome, I'm great, I'm hyped, I'm pumped up to talk to you about mysticism. Thanks so much for doing this, and, and thanks so much for uh, coming on to talk about such a broad topic. Uh, but before we dive into this fascinating topic, that is, if you know anything about our show, uh, you're probably a mystic or interested in mysticism. But before we get to that, uh, we do need your financial support to do the show. Uh, and you can help us out on Patreon for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. Uh, you can put a cap on that if you're scared. We're going to do a billion pieces of media and charge you a billion dollars. We usually try to do more pieces of media than what we charge for. So you're you're actually pumping more Gnosticism, mysticism, scholarship, cool people. And the cool people are not me, right? I, I'm just the uh, I'm just a messenger. I'm just the annoying person getting cool people to speak. So don't don't make this about me. If you're watching this, you're like, I already hate this guy. This is the first time I've ever watched a show. You're going to love Emily and all of our other guests. Uh, you can also do one-time donations at paypal.com slash Gnostic. And if you can't help us out financially, or even if you can actually, we understand that these are difficult times. You can uh, spread the light of Gnosis, get the word out there by telling people about the show, by posting it on your social media, by emailing your favorite episode to someone you know, uh, playing the digital archons game, liking, subscribing, uh, leaving us reviews, all of that pushes up higher in the rankings. Uh, we've got to live in the world that we've got, not the one that we want, folks. Okay, uh, Emily, we starting off with, with, with an easy question. Uh, how do you define met mysticism, or, or what's a definition or, or definitions that, that you like? Not an easy question. Um, so... You know, I, it's a, yeah, as you said, it's a broad, broad topic. I like I like to go to etymology usually. That's that's my my go to when all else fails. So um, you know, etymologically, mysticism comes from a Greek word meaning to close one's eyes, and so it points to a kind of hidden reality under the visible world, or or something else we might do with our eyes and and gain knowledge. Um, some kind of secret or veiled uh, reality. So, so I guess like Gnosticism would be one facet of that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely a subset for sure. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't really think you can you can be a uh, be a Gnostic uh, without being a mystic. Of course, you can be a mystic without being a Gnostic. Although Gnosis plays a role in mysticism. Hey. Words are fun. Emily, what draws you to mysticism? <laughs> um, words are fun. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think I think that sentence, like words are fun, probably probably drew me to mysticism before I knew I was like drawn to mysticism. Do you know what I mean? Um, I'm a writer. I'm I mostly write um, I don't know poetry and kind of works that are hybridized or blend forms in some way. I'm often like experimenting with forms and because mysticism is always about an experience of some kind of limit, like a limit of knowledge, um, the question of how to use language when you reach a limit is quite interesting because a lot of um, the, the usual ways we like instrumentalize or think through the word um, collapse and, and like perhaps new possibilities open up, you know, like this idea of describing the indescribable is like a, a proposition of mysticism, but also of poetry, you know, and art. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, you know, I, I, I talk a lot on the show and a lot in general, you know, the post enlightenment's early modernity to now, we created this thing called religion, which is separate in its own category from the rest of human experience. But uh, transcendence, the states of being and the search that you're looking for, I think is found in all sorts of places, uh, definitely art. And, and I think in a secular age, secular societies, uh, art, art's art got to be it, right? Um, uh, it's not the only way, but if we're going to look for for us who are interested, I'm not I'm not necessarily going to speak for you in reenchantment mysticism. Uh, it's it, it's it, art is is probably going to be the the main the main focus. 
uh, because the age of religion may may or may not be over. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully it's not. Um, but yeah, that, that's very interesting because communicating, as people can tell right now, is hard enough. I, I can never get across what's in my head. Right, I can never find the words exactly, and I'm a writer as well, and I, I'm a writer who, who famously hates writing, um, and part of that is is the beauty uh, and the superb work that exists in here is is never going to arrive onto the page, right? It, it, I'll never be able to transmit that out. So, just trying to talk to you right now uh, and finding the words, let alone describing the ineffable. Um, <laughs> It, it, it's quite the challenge. It's quite the conundrum. Um, but talking about describing the ineffable, talking about talking about talking about mysticism, I understand that you have some upcoming courses on both mysticism and mystical topics and related topics. Can you tell us a bit about those, Emily? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, okay. So I'm teaching a class broadly called mysticism. Um, that starts actually quite soon on the 30th, um, this Sunday, I think that is, yeah. So um, we're gonna kind of find, it's five weeks, we're gonna try to find like sort of five entry points into this topic of mysticism, like five slices. So we're gonna talk about everything from like, um, you know, the darkness mysticism of pseudo Dionysius and some of the Christian uh, medieval mystics that sort of followed. Um, his texts um, to, I don't know, like George Bataille and religion without religion and like, what do we do with with uh, mysticism after the death of God? How do we write mysticism? Um, so we're going to kind of come at these topics through, I guess, um, philosophical means, but also like through the lens of, of being writers and artists. A lot of writers and artists take my classes. So we're going to sort of try to deconstruct these texts, which are quite formally interesting. You know, a lot of times these these mystical texts are like, I don't know, there's almost like a kind of muscular, like a muscular openness, if you know what I mean. Like the sort of the, the rigor and like, t like how tiring it is to like remain open to something like an unmediated experience. I mean, we talk about how hard it is to even communicate like here over Zoom or whatever, or to another human being, let alone like waiting for some kind of divine darkness to arrive. Um, and a lot of these like texts are really interesting because um, there's a lot of waiting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's a lot of waiting around and a lot of like, God's not there, you know, where, where's God, God's not there. And then, um, these like sort of flashes, you know, flashes in through the cloud of unknowing or through a kind of a kind of super sensual darkness. Um, so that's one. I don't know if this like even begins to answer the question of like what what are my classes about? But that's like sort of those are some of the routes we're going to be like going down in that first class. And then I also have a class on <laughs> specifically on media and angelology. So we're going to be combining like medieval angel angelology texts with like um more contemporary philosophers of media and theology so people like byung chul han and sybil kramer and stuff so i think it's going to be fun i mean this question of mediation i think is one reason i'm interested in mysticism because we're in like hyper hyper mediated times it's like often these like digital spheres i find like almost almost i don't know if you have this experience but it's like they bring up some of these like fundamental questions of mediation, like what is in the space between us, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I explore and think about those issues right now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> we're having a mediated technological experience. Yeah, um, there, there should be like a mysticism and Zoom class. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, well, I, I know the perfect person to teach it. <laughs> um, Emily, instead of asking questions, I just like to list a bunch of concepts and then say, what do you think about that? Okay. So, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about death of God and, and radical theology, I, I'm sure. But death of God, radical theology, I, I think some people would, and of course, these are very broad movements. You know, there's a lot of thinkers that, that don't necessarily agree with each other. Uh, lots of theologians, lots of artists, lots of people kind of working in those spaces. But that said, uh, the mystical writings about absence 
the void, the, the lack, uh, the darkness. You know, I think of Meister Eckhart, right? You know, God is empty, you know, is, is the experience. God is darkness. God is silent, right? Mm -hmm. the, the first father in Gnosticism, the, the all-known um, uh, singular plurality that lies behind even the pleroma, which we cannot conceive of, is, is still, is quiet, is dark. Do you, do you see any connection between these themes and, and some of what comes up in Death of God and uh, radical uh, uh, theology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, uh, the, well, you know, one person I come back to again and again is George Bataille, and um, he kind of posited this interesting, like, mysticism headless mysticism or headless theology um where what where god once was there is you know nothingness or a void of some sort and so this idea of like um a kind of shattering experience instead of like a totality um everywhere in bataille you see like kind of frag like literal fragment like right like you write sort of in a fragmented way but also um fragmented experiences and a kind of encounter with the nothingness that also um, potentially like you know negates the self um, so it's like when you when you step into the nothingness you're not like oh I'm in the nothingness it's like you, you're not even you you know what I mean so um, I always think of what I think of something Simone Weil said which is like I'm sort of paraphrasing but it's you know to accept the void in oneself is supernatural. And I think especially now when we're like being offered all these remedies for our voids, you know, um, consumerism and whatever else, I, I really like that sentiment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and you know, there, there's a number of thinkers and systems that, that kind of get to that place, right? Of, hey, let, let's stop trying to fill the void because it can't be filled. <laughs> <laughs> right, even like psychoanalysis or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, perhaps this leads quite well to my next question, which is, what does mysticism have to do with horror? I love this question. Did you ask this question because you've like seen some of my work? Yes. Okay. <laughs> not just like a psychic. Um, I mean, no, I'm I, I I'm psychic. And that, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a vision and an angel descended and said, ask her about horror and mysticism. <laughs> um, and I, okay, continue. Well, I want to hear about, about your thoughts on horror and mysticism or horror and Gnosticism too. Yeah. But... Uh, right, yeah. But yeah, if you want to go me, first. You, you want to go first because I'm a big dum-dum, so... I'm, I'm a big dum-dum to... too. Well, okay. I think a lot of mysticism and, like, philosophy... Is about like becoming dumb, right? Or like sort of just yeah. being dumb. So yeah, um, we're just two dumb um, Yeah, well, you know that the famous uh, Socrates. I think he said, uh, 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 "I'm the the wisest man in the world because I'm a bimbo." Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so horror and mysticism. I mean, yeah, I write a lot about horror movies, um, scary movies, and. Um, I mean, you know, it kind of goes back to like what we were talking about in the beginning, this idea of being met with something that is hard to comprehend, whether that's some kind of freaky darkness or a monster um, or someone like coming at you, you know, doing violence, whatever it is. But like um, another, uh, not to like keep bringing up Bataille, but he's, he's a person that I sort, sort of is, like mediates a lot of my thinking about mysticism and horror because... Um, he often is associating mysticism with eroticism and limit experiences and also like this kind of ambiguity um, and thinking. He has like all these interesting moments where he's talking about thinking itself is like the realm of horror and we need a kind of thought that doesn't fall apart in the face of horror, which I really like. It also points to these like interesting formal concerns, like how do we, how do we write or continue to think when we're met with something that is beyond what we can write or write about or think about. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this idea of like the contemporary horror, or like whatever, any kind of horror film or even horror, like horror fiction or the horror genre being like our modern day, like 
mysticism I, I really enjoy. Um, I like all kinds of horror movies. I really love like sort of lowbrow like trash. Um, and I also really love like kind of extreme horror, like um, some of the new French extremity people I think are like quite mystical. Um, Ga do you know Gaspar Noé? I think about him a lot. And like even like Lars von Trier, I think there's a lot in there that um, is in weird conversation with some of these um, mystical texts. Yeah, I mean, the most obvious one would be martyrs, right? There you go. Yeah, exactly. Um, for Gnosticism and horror, we have done a number of shows on it. I, I, I actually have a playlist. Maybe I'll stick this one in for fun, right? So for a couple of reasons, I'd say that there's there's some interesting intersections between Gnosticism and horror. On on a on a less deep philosophical level, it's the you know the Gnostic myths are very compelling and make for great stories. Mm -hmm. So just as a storytelling engine, right? A, a lot of horror writers consciously borrow from the uh, from the Gnostic myths, even if they're not consciously mm -hmm. making you know deeper points about reality they may end up doing so or sometimes they are making deeper points about reality but i think there's a lot and you know I, i'm drawing on when i say gnosticism i mean the whole la last two thousand years right whenever i say that word which is a lot um <laughs> but I, I hear criticisms of scholars in my head who, are, who say you know john when you're when you're talking about gnosticism this, this particular theory this particular element you know you're really talking about 1950s existentialist uh, understandings, reinterpretations of these ancient texts, and they never would have read them this way, right? And, and scholars love saying stuff like that, even though we don't talk about any other religion in that way. So going to the existentialist 1950s take on Gnosticism, which is that, that existential terror uh, of creation. Um, you know, creation is a mistake. Um, so, and, and God is literally a monster. Um, in Gnosticism, he's portrayed as, as a horrible monster, right? So mm -hmm. a giant snake with a lion's head and flashing eyes. So you don't get much heavy horror than that, right? A, a cosmos that it's a trap, uh, a god who is uh, a horrible demon. And then when you're quote unquote searching for the true god, the true god's completely alien, right? Uh, destroys anything that, that we could possibly know within this cosmos. Um, uh, completely outside of, of not only human existence, but the existence of the beings that are said to be above us, right? That is, that is the alien god, and it too is, is terrible, terrifying. I, I think there's a lot of, for body horror. Uh, again, we're going to take in the last 2,000 years. If we look at the ancient Gnostics, I think sometimes the, the issues of the body are overstated, but mm -hmm. it was a diverse, diverse movement. So yeah, lots of Gnostics hated the body, hate the body. I know a number uh, who are quite strict dualists who, who hate the body. I know lo some that love the body. Anyways, body horror, right? If, if you had this idea that, that the body is a cage, the uh, Soma Sema, the body is a tomb, then I think you have a lot of fun horror themes of that, right? Um, so yeah, so there, there's some of the, the connections that, that I see, you know, specifically between Gnosticism and horror. Yeah, that's so interesting, this idea of like the body being a, a cage. I mean, I, I feel like in this sense, we're in a little like sort of Gnostic Gnostic times, maybe this idea. I, you know, I hear so I hear so many people like sort of referring to the body and in, in like, you know, like, like as a meat suit or something, or like, maybe this is like the whole tech transcendence thing. I'm not really sure. Or perhaps I'm not, yeah, I don't know. I'm curious. Do you think we're, do you think we're in quite Gnostic times, even though I guess Gnosticism is such a broad, a broad term, because sometimes I think, and maybe this is like an interesting point of like intersection and divergence with like some of these Christian mystics I'm talking about and Gnosticism, because sometimes, you know, they're sort of affirming the body, especially like someone like Angela Foligno or something who George Bataille talked about a lot. She was like having these tremendous like bodily experiences, which seemed to both be horrific, but also in a sense like, oh, this is like a vessel for experiencing, you know, X, Y, and Z. So there, there was a kind of like divinity of the body too. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, St. Teresa is a great example of that. But but even when you look at, you know, systems that are trying to get people to have mystical experiences and enlightenment, um, 
many of them use the body, right? So uh, the Gurdjieff, um, uh, the yoga, uh, Tibetan yeah. Buddhism, right? You're using yeah. the energies of the body, you're using the body, you might have some issues with the body, but it is, uh, uh, it, it is a tool for enlightenment in, in many of these systems, which, which I don't think a lot of, of people understand or a lot of mystics understand or people want to be mystics or first start reading about mysticism, that, that the body does play uh, such a role when you are working uh, with an organized system uh, uh, in many cases. Um, I mean, this may be something we can talk about, about shortly, right? Because I, I think sometimes, uh, you know, if you read somebody like Plotinus, uh, I think Plotinus probably had a, a full system of praxis of things to do that, that we're now missing, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look at the great Christian mystics, I think people uh, sort of have a Protestant bias. I mean, in Protestantism, you have, uh, there's no mediation between you and God. Right, so you you can just sit around and have experiences of the divine. I mean, you read and you pray mm -hmm. and you have experiences of the divine. Mm -hmm. So when we retroactively read the Christian mystics, we we read them through that lens, not realizing, of course, you know, if you're in a monastery, if you are a desert father or mother, you know, you you're doing stuff all day long, right? You're doing intense contemplative yeah. prayer, right? You are actually using the body. You know, you're either starving it or you're kneeled for hours or you're in a uh, cruciform uh, form on. The the floor so so yeah so so i i think the um the the embodiment uh in mysticism is we're often missing it uh that was a tangent i meant to get on a different tangent uh emily i do believe we live in gnostic times and i'm gonna i'm gonna put a little asterisk on that and sort of drawing from the work of harold bloom of whom i haven't read that much and you know i'm gonna do a show on bloom and and kind of tear through his works but you know the bloom considered himself a gnostic not in a religious sense he considered his literary uh theory to be a form of gnosticism and he called mm -hmm. himself a gnostic but at the same time he sort of wrote critically about um about religion in america you know religion like mormonism some of the new age religions and he said that the true religion of america is gnosticism and i think we can tease from his work an idea of positive gnosticism and negative gnosticism hmm. because of course you know i can look at christianity and i can easily get the idea of positive christianity and negative christianity positive christianity dorothy day negative christianity the spanish inquisition right so, so Gnostic ideas, uh, I believe, are, are, are much more common than, than we want to admit and do. And when I say Gnostic ideas, of course, you know, for someone like me, where Gnosticism is a totalizing system, I can bring a lot into it and say, yeah, that's Gnostic, right? Um, but ideas that, that I think you really can trace a lineage of back to the ancient Gnostics are much more prevalent than, than we want to recognize or admit. So I, I think what you're talking about, this uh, meat sush, uh, um, a new insidious form of transhumanism, uh, this uh, wanting to to get out of this world, right? To not live in this world. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think these these are ideas that that are perhaps in negative Gnosticism, and you know I, I hope that I represent positive Gnosticism. But it's it's something it's a it's a formulation I've been sort of playing around in 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 my head a little bit. And as I said, you can kind of draw it from from Bloom. I think Dr. Nina Power talks a little bit about it too. She's been doing some work on Gnosticism lately. So so I I, I think it's an idea that might have legs. Yeah. No, I like that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and it's interesting to think about that in the context of horror, body horror specifically, because sometimes, like I just, I, have you seen Titan, Julia Ducournau's movie? No. It's like, she did Raw, which is like the sort of cannibal, yeah. cannibal movie a few years back. Yeah, so it's like quite, it's quite, um, I think there's some, some kinds of like um, questions about tech transcendence, but also this idea of what it might mean to be human in times when we're like attached to all these machines all the time. And so I think, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of going on a tangent myself here, but I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking. I don't know what like I'm really answering or saying, but yeah, I'm just sort of thinking about this, this film and, and ideas about tech transcendence, but also like the other the, the, the potentially, I don't know, positive Gnostic side of it, which might be like, or positive mystical side, which might be something like um, reimagining what a human can be or developing a new set of like aesthetics or ethics around, um, you know, some of our 
uh, you know, whatever Spinoza said about like, we don't yet know what a body can do, this, this kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, who are some underknown mystics in your opinion? And who are some figures that, that you consider mystics that some might find to be a surprising choice? <sighs> underknown mystics. Well, do you, first of all, do you have, can I ask, do you have like a working definition of mysticism? Nah. I, I say the word almost almost every time on this show. Let me think. What's what, what's a working definition? I, I mean, it's um, union with the ultimate reality in an experience that is not day to day that cannot be described. Uh, it, maybe I shouldn't even say union. Experience of some sort of ultimate reality uh, that um, supersedes the day to day and can't be put into words. Yeah, yeah, okay, that that's not the best definition, but uh, it'll no, be. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think for me, um, film films are good are a good place for this, um, yeah. and filmmakers, or you know, it's hard to say if like the the people who make these films are mystics or if they're um, just like offering some kind of mystical mystical experience, or if those two things kind of are blurry. Um, but I would say I'm writing a lot about, as I mentioned before. Um, Gaspar Noé, so like his movie Enter the Void, I think it does something kind of, have you seen it? It does something kind of mystical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the idea of like, the, I mean, the way the camera moves too, it's like the content, but it's also the way he moves the camera. It's almost like the camera's been drugged um, and Irreversible, which is also one of his movies. The, this idea of, I think, I'm really, I'm really interested in this idea of like formal enactments of mysticism or what a kind of like finding form for the formless kind of kind of idea um so i think his movies are kind of brilliant in that way and then also poets like i'm a i think film filmmakers and poets so i don't know like fred moten alejandro pizarnik i would say um you know uh also like i love the films of hollis frampton like sort of structural i think that there's something really I don't know if he would, I don't think that he would say this necessarily, but there's something mystical um, in the sense of like revealing the hidden hidden form or structure of a film, you know, um, like so what some of those people in like the 60s and 70s were doing, um, you know, like showing the sprocket holes and stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I like these sort of like physical, physical enactments of some some kind of hidden reality, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not to be too much of a of a basic bitch, but um, <laughs> the you know I'm I'm a big David Lynch fan. That's not basic. Oh, totally. Know. Me too. Yeah. I can't believe I didn't mention Lynch. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, how not, that's not basic bitch. No, nah, it's not basic bitch. He rules, <laughs> and he's he's tough. I mean, he's literally a mystic. You know, he said he, he gets his ideas mystic, through through meditation. Mm -hmm. um, and and of course, he uses horror tropes. He's not quite a horror director, but he knows what he's doing, right? He is using the filmic language of horror often. Um, but yeah, I find him to be to be a mystic. And I find a lot of his works are exploring mysticism. And I don't think it's just my theory. And I, I'm not, don't ask me to follow up on it because I'm still kind of working on it. But you know, <laughs> Twin Peaks season three, Twin Peaks to return is obviously about a lot of things, but I think it's partly about meditation. Um, and partly about meditation experiences. But uh, I'll come back to that in a future show. We've, you know, I, I'm such a Lynch fan, I almost don't like examining his work or like coming back to it too it. much. I know, I know exactly what you mean. I think, well, there's something about, or should I stop talking about? No, please, no, yeah. Do it. <laughs> we yeah. must not speak of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is something, uh, he said something like Eraserhead is his most, spiritual film <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um and, but he wouldn't elaborate of course he never elabor elaborates but he um there's something with about lynch that when people um uh, interpret his work it kind of pisses me off yes. like and i write about him too so i guess i'm like pissing myself off too but like this idea there there's something really brilliant about i mean not to like keep bringing it back to like formal elements and light and blah blah, blah but there's something am brilliant that he does with like just what's there in the film and how he uses the camera and lighting. And um, a lot of times people immediately do interpretations of him that are like, you know, really psychoanalytic or this means this or like what's going on behind um, behind the the image. But I think there's something about, so, so yeah, in that sense, it's like, there's something that, something about Lynch that feels mystical just like in the moment and the way that he um, he uses time and the uncanny 
like I love Lost Highway. I could like, there's that one incredible, right? Like that one stretch of Lost Highway in the middle. Oh my God. Yeah. No, I, I even though I, I find it difficult to 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 talk about him, I'm probably going to do a mini series just just on Lynch or like nice. a second show or something. Of course, it, it probably won't be a mini series; it'll probably stretch on as long as Talk Gnosis because there will be infinite amounts to talk about. <laughs> and there's of course lots of Gnostic themes, lots of mystical themes. Yeah. Um, you know, Twin Peaks deliberately through Mark Frost has uh, occult themes, right? So he is sort mm. of deliberately putting them in while um, uh, David Lynch is weaving in his uh, downloads straight from <laughs> from uh, uh, the other place. Um, in the downloads. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, so you mentioned your course, uh, your courses, and that you get a lot of uh, writers, creators. But I think, you know, you're, you're talking about the religion and mysticism, and you know, all these dead Christians. Should should <laughs> atheists or, or agnostics take your course or look into mysticism, or is it just for people who are faithful of some kind? And then the second second part of the question, I phrase it as, what about the Christian mystics? Isn't Christianity like gross, like you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good question. Um, I mean, yeah, there we are reading quite, quite a few dead Christians. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, certainly my, my classes are for the, the faithless, the faithful, the people who have faith in the faithless, what, you know, any combination. I don't even know where I fall on this scale. I mean, but we're, oh, we're looking at these things through, not through like a religious lens, but we're looking at religion through um, philosophy and, and writing and things like this. So, and I think we, we also, we are living in like really, um, you know, religion is everywhere. It's just like, you know, uh, it's not obvious, it's sort of veiled. So I think looking at religion philosophically is really important. Um, it's helpful. And, um, and then in the, I'm teaching, actually, I don't know if I mentioned this, but, um, something happens in like the land of zoom where I'm like, I don't know what I'm saying. Um, but <laughs> like negative mystical experience where I'm like, where am I? But, um, I'm teaching a class, a, a co-teaching a class at GCAS in March, which is it's called philosophical. Oh yeah, there's the link, uh, philosophical theology. So it's kind of a very, it's sort of like a tour of um, some of the early Christian ideas, Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, and then some some mystical currents, and then also all the way up to like radical theology. So I'm, I'm co-teaching that with Barry Taylor and Creston Davis. So that should be like quite exciting too. Yeah, that, that's a, that's extremely cool, and I'm looking forward to taking that course. And also, um, uh, Th this question is interesting too because it's like you know i think we're ex I, I don't know if you notice this but i think i think i notice this thing where it's often like oh i you know maybe it's the internet i'm not sure but this idea of like one can only take a class about something they agree with or, or something or you know i don't even know that i right i'm not like there to present work that i agree with or that i think is like correct it's just i'm there to sort of help like sort of facilitate an environment where people can think so not to say like this is what i think you should think this too so i think there is this question of like yeah like thinking is the space of horror in the sense that we're always going to be coming up against what what is strange to us yeah. you know yeah no i i would be well talking about strange terrible and, and horrible you know I, I would hate to take a, a course where i agreed with, with everything and I, I don't think i ever have and probably never will right you know famously famously as we like to say if you get five gnostics in a room you'll you'll get six opinions but it, i've never found a, a totalizing thinker or a totalizing system or uh any kind of professor who's secretly a guru who who can who can say exactly 100 percent everything i agree with i mean i agree with 50 percent of it six percent of it 100 percent of it or none of it so it is uh, a very bad dangerous awful terrible idea that you should mm -hmm. only take courses about things you agree with because how are you how are you going to learn how are you going to grow um how is your intellect going to be challenged so uh yeah, yeah. um emily um through everything from drugs to meditation to ecstatic all night dancing, and this is coming back to something I was talking about at the beginning, it seems like people are trying to induce secular mystical states, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even if they're not explicitly religious, perhaps if they are not explicitly religious. Uh, do you think that these states of being are, are similar or, or the same as the mystical experience that, that you know, the religious people have or that just people had that the mystics in the, the, the Middle Ages had? 
hard to say. <laughs> um, I think I think it's a very human desire, right, to like look for um, a way out or an escape or a way out that might also be an, another way in. Um, so I think like the question of like God or drugs or whatever it is, um, it's usually maybe a question of how, like how the thing is being used, um, if that makes sense. Uh, and yeah, like if it's, if it's being used as a sort of permanent escape or if it's being used to like think differently. I mean, also we're in really like kind of addictive, addictive times. So I would say there's something about like using like the, the sort of propensity to use anything as a drug, I guess it's possible. Like, right, like, like religion even being the opiate of the masses. Although I heard, I think in one of Mark Fisher's writing, he, he says that um, that therapy is not the opiate of the masses. Yeah. So like this idea of self-help, um, it reminds me of uh, that um, William Hurt movie uh, where he, what is it, Altered States? Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, where it's like sort of going so far in that you kind of like implode or explode. Um, so I think there's that danger, you know what I mean? Um, so I, I think always kind of coming back to this, this world or, um, you know, our material reality, it feels important. Um, but yeah, it's a question of kind of like time and how you're doing it and in all of these things. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think uh, it does come out of a similar drive, right? The drive for transcendence. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know. And of course, I, I can't know because I can't get into their heads and I can't get into the heads of uh, ancient mystics, right? But but I, I suspect, uh, and, and I think we're in agreement here, that the drive is the same, right? It's lovely. It's, it's the, I call it a drive for transcendence instead of a, a religious drive, uh, but it seems to be programmed into people and can be expressed in a number of different ways, right? Yeah. Traditionally, religion has been our, our main output. But I think the having things happen to you, doing things, right? Um, this has sort of been moved out of the West, Western religion, you know, uh, uh, the mainstream Protestantism, main, mainstream Catholicism, you know, you try to be a good person and you go to go to church on Sunday, right? So, and of course, there are, there are religions and faiths, although it's kind of over-exaggerated because uh, a lot of times um, transcendence, enlightenment, meditation were, were for people in uh, monasteries, both, both East and West. But because we both have that as our religious heritage and that religion is, has is going away. Uh, I think we sort of have a double whammy for looking for these outlets for transcendence, if that makes sense. Uh, and I think too the you know the what seems to be a trend that, that that won't let up. I think it's died down a little bit. You're in New York, right, or New Jersey? New um, Jersey, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, like uh, the the witch thing, you know, uh, cultism and, and, and witchery. Yeah. I I think it's part of the drive for transcendence, but also this 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 drive for for being involved, for doing, for actioning, for drawing down the moon, right? For bringing the, the kingdom of heaven down to earth. Yeah. Um, yeah, the classical theurgy, even if people don't realize that that's sometimes what they're doing, right? They uh, they may think that they're originally in it for, for sorcery. Uh, I'm going to do this this spell to, uh, you know, get a lover or a better job. But, mm -hmm. I, you know, what I read about the young witches um you know the 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 hep, the hep generation zeds and the um uh, the young millennials uh, a lot of the times you know they're talking about you know this stuff isn't really for you know we call it a spell and we call it magic but it's not really for this day today stuff right mm -hmm. it's it's for something deeper so yeah so i think that that's sort of an expression you know a more classic religious uh, expression uh, of this um, well, yeah. on this topic, so the scholar in me favors constructionism, but the mystic in me favors uh, phenomenological perennialism. And, uh, you know, I, it was a long time ago that I did my first degree. I did religious studies. So perennialism is, is still in the academy. It was basically what, how I was taught about mysticism. But it, mm -hmm. it is that it's older scholars, for the most part, that take the perennial view. It's, it's, not, it's getting more and more frowned upon in, in the academy. I'm not going to define any of those words. Maybe you will, or people can just go to Wikipedia. It's the 21st century. So what do you think? <laughs> what are your thoughts on constructionism uh, versus uh, perennialism? Um, it's a good, it's a really good question. I mean, I think, first of all, to, I just want to say, like, talking about the sort of witchcraft thing and this idea of, like, 
uh, a desire for transcendence or bringing something down to earth. I, this is, I see this everywhere. Yeah, I think this is like hardcore trending. And I think um, it has something also to do with like, uh, we crave ritual. And I think, so I think like this, the space of the festival um, uh, is maybe lost or, or something. And um, which is of course like an early art form and uh, I think that I think that Gaspar Noe's movie Climax is a really good um, <laughs> shit. It's like a total shit show, um, but also moments of transcendence. But it shows horror really, really, really well. Um, anyway, so it's kind of like the whole thing. Anyway, whatever. It's many climaxes, but um, this idea of transcendence on the dance floor, but also like I think that this I that coming back to this idea of like temporality like at some point the festival becomes a kind of crypt you know yeah. um if you stay too long <laughs> or you can't I mean this is also like horror movies like the fun house like the Tobe Hooper movie or like even Texas Chainsaw Massacre are really good for for thinking about like when the festival turns horrific but anyway um about your very good question about perennialism and construction I mean this makes me think about the, the immediately when you asked this question I thought about um that moment in in Hamlet where he's like, thou art a scholar, Horatio, speak to, you know, it's like this idea of like, oh, you're a scholar. So, you, you know, figure out how to talk to the ghost or get the ghost to talk, but that doesn't work. He doesn't get it. He doesn't get the ghost. So, um, I mean, it's like this question of like how to be a mystic and a scholar it reminds, it also reminds me of the quest, like this idea of not, not to bring everything back to writing, but like we like you can't edit yourself and write at the same time, or you'll go batshit, um, or nothing will happen, or whatever. So yeah, I mean there is. I don't know if I really have an answer to that, but I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, I favor, I guess. I mean, it's interesting because like thinking about some of my some experiences that I might have had that have felt mystical. Um, I don't know how I'm really, I don't even know if I have access to like how I might be using those to think about mystical texts or when I teach or, you know, um, yeah, so, so there, there is a sort of gap, I think, I think for, for me in terms of, um, the scholar and the mystic and how they might, may interact or not interact. Yeah. Yeah. What about um, you? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to take the easy, easy way out, um, which is I sort of have a, a middle ground approach, which is the, the perennial view for many years is sort of over exaggerated about j just how similar uh, mi world mystical systems are. And, uh, and of course, how slippery that term mysticism is. But at the same time, uh, it does seem like we are in some ways, even though it can be very hard to, to have mystical experiences, we are hardwired for them. So that, yeah. you know, that leads to, to a form of perennialism. Um, and then that those experiences are, especially sort of the beginning and the ends and how you get there, very culturally shaped. Right. Uh, you know, when it comes to, oh, I forgot to put this on the question sheet, but we'll talk about it next. But self annihilation, right? I, I, I'm assuming that that experience is the same in any human culture since there is mm. no longer any self. <laughs> um, <laughs> Right, but how you, how you might get there, I guess, is different. Yeah, how you may get there is different. And then what is happening to you and what you think is going on is probably culturally constructed. The end point uh, uh, might be the same. But of course, mm -hmm. again, how we don't have, we, we can't talk about it. We don't have any language for it. Um, but uh, the talking and bringing it all back home, but but self-extinguishment, right? The, the, <laughs> the end of the self in the mystical yeah. experience. I, I mean, we can also tie in some some uh, probably some horror, some existential horror to that as well. But uh, again, can you can you speak a little bit about that? Do you find it in in all the mystics that you uh, that you talk about in your courses? What do you think about this idea of self extinguishment? What do you think about this idea of, of the self has to be completely removed um, uh, to have these experiences and to learn from them? And you know, the self obviously comes back afterwards. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, go off, Queen. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think. Certainly, this idea of self, 
annihilation. It's everywhere. I mean, even like in Zen, like to, to forget the self is called entering heaven. You know, there's, um, I'm talking about it in the upcoming class, specifically in terms of Marguerite Porette, who was um, burned at the stake rather horrifically and famously, you know, was like totally um, straight faced, like, you know, didn't put up a fight, just, it, I think it quite disturbed the crowd. Uh, not only the burning at the stake part, but her like kind of poker face. Um, and, be, and she was burned because um, of her, her sort of guide, kind of like a guidebook. Um, are you familiar with it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, um, and, and she described the kind of really interesting process of union with the divine through like she describes it, I think, as like hacking away at the self. So you create this kind of space inside the self that the divine can like use as a mirror. So you're not there, but <laughs> yeah. but the divine can see, that God can see himself. And so it's quite interesting, but um, she, was, she was hanged for um, and burned for being a kind of, I guess they called it a relapsed heretic um, and a fake woman. And Anne Carson has a really interesting book called Decreation, and uh, she sort of kind of poetically um, translates some of Marguerite Porette's experiences and puts them in conversation with Sappho and Simone Weil. So we'll be looking at that text too. So I'm really interested also in these ideas, like sort of how these experiences of self-annihilation get translated. Yeah. Um, into other kinds of texts, like like find, finding a form for these horrific, um, I don't know, yeah, like kind of many chambered annihilation seems seems interesting to me. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I find the topic fascinating. It's also sort of funny and cosmically ironic, right? Because you know you talk about poor age, you know, she kind of has a system, right? There's things you have to do. You have to do that hollowing out. You know, same thing with the time, the same thing with all the grades, right? Um, they, you have to do a lot of work. Uh, and then the ironic thing is you don't get to enjoy it because there's no you. Right. <laughs> you, know, you spend your entire <laughs> life getting there, but you can't get there because you can't be you when you get there. It's it's also kind of how you can, for me, it's how I square the circle with, with perhaps some of the more depressing philosophical worldviews that come out of psychoanalysis, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is, you, you know, contradiction is the only truth. Uh, uh, we have a drive for wholeness, but wholeness is an illusion. Um, uh, but perhaps wholeness is, you know, the, I, I get to have a hack. I get to have my cake and eat it too, because I can play with and subscribe to some of these these concepts, some of these psychoanalytic and philosophical concepts, because it's true, right? The self can't. Uh, the, the self can't be whole. Uh, the self is contradictory. Uh, but when the self is gone, yeah, yeah, the rules are rules are out the window. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. It's interesting. Yeah, it becomes it, it is kind of absurd. It becomes about then, um, like the memory of it, or like the fleeting like flex of memory that you might have if you're still alive after <laughs> after the annihilation. Um, how to how to kind of recount that, or or like constantly in like I'm thinking of like Angela Felinia's memorial. She's constantly like. Um, She's like, I don't know, I'm not doing it justice. You know, I'm not, the words keep falling short. Um, so there's also like, there's the labor of that, of the sort of self-annihilation. And then there's the labor of writing, which I don't know if you feel like this as a writer, but I often feel like I'm self annihilate Like, I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, I feel like it is sometimes a process of annihilation. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how I, how I feel about it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and again, you know, we, we, uh, the, uh, we talk a lot about creativity on on the show, right? And the demiurge, uh, you know, you, you could translate it as, as craftsman, craftsperson, creator. Um, and uh, in some Gnostic systems, the, the demiurge is actually a more positive figure. Some Gnostic systems, a very negative demonic figure, as I said before. But, but I think there's something very Gnostic about creating. You know, I think that's part of the metaphors that are involved with uh, the Gnostic myths is we are saying something about creating the need for creation, the need for humans to create, how humans are actually divine, more divine, can create better. Humans can create better than the God of this world. Uh, we find ourselves through creation. We lose ourselves through creation. I think these are 
in the myths. I, I don't think they're read-ins from me. But if they are read-ins, then they're helpful read-ins. But, you know, we talk a lot about creativity art um, on, on the show. I mean, we have a lot of artists, and we, my, my personal belief as well is that, you know, whatever this religion, spirituality thing is, it's, it's either the same or very similar to uh, this, this art stuff, which, which I guess I've already made that point, right? This is, this is our, our main outlet for, for transcendence right now is, is art. So, yeah. uh, Emily, I, I'm out of questions. Um, <laughs> do you, do you have anything you want to wrap up on or? No, I mean, what you just said made me think about, um, about something Batai said about poet. He says poetry is like, you know, like residues of the sacred in an otherwise like profane, profane time. And I think, like this idea of, of finding residues is very appealing to me. Like, you know, poetry, I feel like is just the name for whatever writing doesn't fit into a kind of category. It's like this kind of uh, interesting trash bin or something. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, something about residues. But yeah, this was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. So let's uh, let's just do your plugs one more time. So your homepage is uh, emilyrusso.com. Um, I will also, for those watching at home, I'm flashing them up on the screen. If you're listening as a podcast or you're washing the dishes and you're on YouTube, don't worry. All these links will be in the show notes because we definitely want to have to have it there. If people go to your, your website, emilyrusso.com, they can sign up for your mysticism course through there, right? Yeah, um, just click on... I think it's upcoming classes yep yeah so this, this show will be out in time so everybody listening and watching you have no excuse you know we're just under the wire but you can sign up now yeah sign uh, up for self-annihilation yeah so uh I mentioned your gcast course again when is it and there's the link it'll also be in the show notes um yeah uh it begins march 8th so it's, it's four weeks in march and it's with myself and um, Creston Davis and um, Barry Taylor, and we'll be talking about philosophical theology, kind of all encompassing. Extremely cool, extremely cool. Emily Russell, thanks so much. Thank you Bye. so much.